event. Uh, and I certainly would like to extend a welcome to our Gift Wills colleague and their visitors they brought, as well as people from WIT and the business community at large. I'd, I'd really, really like to thank the EPA for providing us with this, with this excellent uh, facilities, and to Margaret, Liana, and Kayleigh for all the hard work they've done in putting it together. So I think without any further ado, I would like to open the event and introduce uh, Dr. Jonathan Dillon from the EPA. Thank you. Hi folks, uh, firstly you're very welcome to EPA, it's our pleasure to host you and uh, uh, I hope you have an enjoyable day. I have no presentation slides or anything now this morning, it'll be 15 minutes and uh, rather than get carried away I said I'd just uh, outline some of the main highlights. Firstly from my point of view, um, I headed up the National uh, Resource Efficiency Programme. Uh, in EPA, I also head up our climate change and our national research, environmental research uh, unit here in EPA. Um, so I have a, this kind of overview of, of through our research program and through climate change and everything, all the sort of the pressures that are coming upon us through environment into a business into our society, and we're trying to design research and design responses. And I suppose that's part of really what GIFT is about. GIFT is about kind of rethinking and redesigning how our business and how our societies respond to um, a more sustainable paradigm of, of uh, economic and social uh, existence. <coughs> now you've heard of this uh, kind of green growth, you know, green economy, carbon neutral uh, economy, uh, sustainability, resilience, this fabulous American word, this resilience word, I really like it, and uh, the circular economy, they're all basically the same thing. They're all really talking about rethinking, redesign, re-engineering how we exist. And uh, why are we concerned? I suppose in the immediate, in the immediate term for uh, uh, businesses here in Ireland and communities, and I assume it's the same in Wales, are you know business costs, utility costs, water, waste, uh, energy, uh, regulatory burden on business, of course, as well. And then there are customer preferences. You'll find your customers are now uh, changing their preferences. You know, they want better value. They want more sustainable. They want to be convinced you are operating ethically as well. And a lot of the larger businesses, through their corporate social responsibility programs, are recognizing this as well. And competitiveness as well. So if you reduce your overheads, you are going to become more competitive and more attractive. You know, it's really about how to differentiate yourself as a business in a fairly busy market. And uh, uh, being sustainable is not just about being a fluffy tree hugger, you know, it's actually a very real business process. You know? And of course, long term, uh, worldwide, there are finite resources. Um, in Europe, we're consuming per capita in Europe about 16 tonnes of raw materials per person per year to sustain our European society and economy. The worldwide average is about eight tons of uh, raw materials. Uh, I suppose we're fortunate, if you can consider it like that, we're actually fortunate that over a third of the world are in poverty and they don't compete with us for these resources. You know? Is that a good thing? I don't know. It's a fairly significant uh, ethical and moral dilemma for us. You know, We're fortunate, we're well off, that we can afford to buy the resources they can't to sustain our economy. But of the 16 tons of resources that we buy in Europe, we waste six tons of it. We throw away one third of what we buy. And that's just an extraordinary level of inefficiency. You know, no individual business, I think, could afford to sustain itself on that sort of uh, uh, degree of wastage, unless they had a really you know, uh, captive audience who were stupid enough to pay for all that inefficiency and the prices charged. Population is the other issue in Ireland over the next 30 years. I'm not so sure about the Welsh statistics, but in Ireland over the next 30 years, 2 million more people are predicted to um, and become part of our population here in Ireland. 2 million more people. That's an extraordinary level of growth in 30 years. That's predicted by the CSO from our current 4.5 uh, million. And that will bring business opportunities, of course it will. It will bring pressures on society as well, on schooling, you know, living, transportation, but it will also bring opportunities. And we have to 
re-engineer how we think and how we how we kind of develop as a society and our, an economy to to accommodate that addition of two million. And worldwide, the population is going to go from seven billion to nine billion by 2050, all consuming these resources. We're if worldwide uh, consumed the rate of raw materials that in Europe we do, or our colleagues in America do, we're, we would eat our way through our planet. Uh, two and a half plants, in fact, is what it takes to sustain us at the current level of European and North American <coughs> consumption. We just, we cannot sustain that. So, the background to this green growth is to kind of awaken us to rethink uh, how we, how we um, uh, exist. I suppose, to put it plainly, and I'm kind of always been a plain speaker, you know, as individuals, as a society, as a, a national and indeed as a, a global com community, we make consumption and production choices that are unsustainable. You know, we just plainly do. We've designed our governance uh, structures, our societies and our economies in ways that are not always considered or indeed protective of the environment. We know that. We're measuring every day the impact. On our, on our environment. And we are consuming our natural resources at a rate that exceeds the planet's capacity to sustain us. You know, that's an easy thing to say. You know. It's very hard for a lot of people actually to grasp that. We're consuming our resources at a rate that exceeds our planet's capacity to sustain us. Now most of us, you know, you're a young student and, and you're just starting out work maybe as a young graduate, you know, you have no idea what a pension is. You know. And it's the last thing in your mind, for the most part. You have to be really kicked in your ass by your parents, I suppose, to remember the pension. But um, it's very difficult for people to think beyond their generation. You know, it's very difficult for individuals to look 20, 30 years beyond. You know? But that's actually what we have to do. We have to force ourselves and try to plot a, a course of where we want to be as a society. You, know, you have to invest time beyond your own immediate selfish needs. That's a very difficult thing for an individual to do. You know? We are, as humans, actually profoundly selfish. And that's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a bad thing, but it's a normal thing, you know? It's very difficult. It's, there's very few of us have that sort of real, I don't know what you would call it, but that real Christian spirit, you know? And I apologize to any other faiths, but it's this outward looking element uh, the selflessness, but we all, we, we tend to live within our own immediate benefits. We are consumerist, uh, and uh, that's going to have to change. You know, we are going to have to try, invest some time in, in considering, uh, I don't want to sound tedious, you know, where your children, where your children's children are going to be, but it is the reality. And it's well, not going to take too long to get to that reality. We will, we will exceed the biophysical limits of the planet, including the essential natu natural resources, such as water, metals, land, and biomass, as well as the assimilative and regenerative capacity of our ecosystems. We rely on the river systems to take the sewage outfall and assimilate it. We rely on our air to take air emissions from your industrial processes or your home fire and assimilate it and make the pollution go away. And it does. It does actually a pretty good job of cleaning up this. You know? But we're beginning to abuse that credit. You know? uh, and we are, not beginning, we are abusing that credit. Uh, certainly uh, in the rate of which we are delivering the waste from our society into the environment at a rate and a concentration we cannot cope with. And we see that in deteriorating water quality in a number of rivers. Uh, and the problem with that is that, that that interferes with the drinking water supply. You know, putting it back to totally selfish, if you don't really care about the bugs and the bees, you know, it's your own drinking water supply you're, you're damaging. The water supply into your creameries, you know, the water supply for your guest house where you have people coming to stay. You, know, you have to supply the water rather than good Irish clean water. The adaptive challenges facing us through, through climate change are also a big issue. Uh, again, this is very long-term stuff, and I was reading there recently some of this research, this whole new concept to me is called phenology. It's this understanding of the cycle of nature. You know, every year around spring, 
leaves begin to come, then you get flowers, insects pollinate, and there's a whole kind of cycle of nature that are all integrated with each other to make sure the crops uh, are delivered on time to the farmers, which then they can be harvested. You know? But with temperature rise, things go out. You know, insects either come early and they come too early for the flowers. You know, and there are going to be changes in how we produce in our agronomic environment with rising temperatures. And we have to engineer for that. We might have to look at different crop systems that will accommodate better and work with this new cycle uh, in, a, in a kind of a higher temperature environment. So the emerging consensus really is to put economies on a more sustainable footing and to be resource efficient, carbon and neutral. It's easy to say, but and this kind of circular economy concept that where uh, the residues, and we would have residues, but the residues are brought back into some useful utility. And this is where there are opportunities for innovation and creativity amongst businesses, and indeed among, amongst research institutions. And you can see down here where the waste products from a piggery are being brought back into a fuel use. So we have to become more creative. And we have to have a kind of a whole new understanding of what prosperity is, you know. Is prosperity purely your salary, you know? Is it purely the amount you have in the bank, you know? Or is it your health? Is it your well-being? You know? Is it a comfortable lifestyle in the fact that you have a nice place to go walking, that you can drink the water, that you can swim in your beaches, their blue five beaches? You know? What does prosperity mean to you? And I think we have to re-engineer what society's understanding of prosperity is. And it's the community element of gift is kind of quite engaged in that. It's communities working together, you know, to improve their overall prosperity, you know, socially and economically. And that's the big challenge. And that's the challenge to business undergraduates as well. And I'm looking at my colleagues here from Watford IT, you know, to re-engineer in these undergraduates what does prosperity mean? Does it mean a short-term return? Or does it mean a long-term sustainable business that, uh, uh, with healthy people and uh, no poverty? These things are, are very big issues, of course. You know. So what happens in the EPA's program on resource efficiency? We work at business level, we work with communities, we work at public services, and we work at homes. So there's are four elements of society we work at, and GIFT is also interacting with those. And why resource efficiency? Well, resource efficiency is about uh, sort of energy uh, reduction, in reducing your energy needs, your water consumption, looking at clean technology. So redesigning your products. Uh, we kind of have two approach to businesses. We kind of first work with them, that we make them as efficient as possible in the products they make. They might be making a crap product, but that's not our, you know, that's not for us to decide. So the first thing is make you as lean as possible making the crap product. And once we've got that and got you quite efficient, then we might try work with you to look at, say, bringing eco-design principles into your product. Okay, let's look at the raw materials you have for your product. Are you designing your product to be dismantled at the end of life? Are you eliminating harmful substances? You know? And if you're a sur in a service, you might be a cleaning service, uh, you might be a septic tank, uh, company that is uh, emptying the sewage as well. It could be any of the range of services across or working at how you're delivering that service and can you do it in a more environmentally friendly way uh, and sustainable way for yourself. So that's the, uh, the kind of resource efficiency model uh, we're working at and uh, pushing through here in Ireland. And there's an awful lot of information on this on our website, begreen.ie. It's very straightforward, begreen.ie. <coughs> So resource efficiency works. It's not some freely concept, but it actually works. In 2012, we saved the Irish hotels groups that are with us. 150 hotels are currently with us in our program. We saved them 6.8 million euros in their overheads. That's a significant saving for just one particular group of businesses that were with us. And. Uh, they also are flagged as green businesses, so anyone who's wishing to come to stay in Ireland and wants to stay in a green hotel, you know the way you can select a hotel where it allows you smoke, whether it allows kids, dogs, you can also select a green hotel. Yeah. But it's making very real differences. The government in here in Ireland 
and I'm not so sure in Wales, but here in Ireland we have committed to this green public procurement. A very big thing. The state spends 15 billion euros every year <coughs> on buying goods and services. Uh, 9 billion goes on uh, kind of hard services, but the other, uh, like roads and infrastructure, but the other uh, seven, uh, six to seven billion is spent <coughs> on goods and services. And they're now going to be pushing out with this buying green. So the people who, if you're wanting to bid into government work, you're going to have to be able to demonstrate some form of environmental credentials, that you are operating in a sustainable way through your business. And uh, there are various ways of achieving that through our green business program or through other marks and other accreditations that you have through UMass, ISO, other forms. There's lots of other accreditation, environmental and sustainability accreditation programs. But that green public procurement will really drive. Even the AP, EPA here, when we are going buying conferences or hotel venues on a, at a corporate level, we only buy those that we know are in the green uh, hospitality uh, program, uh, where we can and where they're available. So it does, it does influence. So our kind of, what we're saying is that what's good for the environment is actually also good for the economy and is good for society. They're not mutually exclusive. Also, there was a famous frog once said, it's not easy being green, you know? But in fact, our sort of vibrant, it actually is. It actually is. And part of our role and part of the role of GIFT is to kind of awaken people's awareness of the opportunities and sharing knowledges, sharing experiences, bringing them in contact with the technology and the advice and others, you know, the experience of others. So there can be this kind of diffusion at ground level, this cross-fertilization, this diffusion. You know, we can't really lead this. Because I don't think the government can do this famous top-down thing, you know, that tell you everything what to do. But really, people have to be awakened to this. You have to be made realize that this is reality, and it is the only practical and logical way if you want your business to survive, and if you want to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. The only way is to you know, diffuse this knowledge and diffuse this behavior of change at community level and build it up through community <coughs> and businesses supporting that. And it's only in that way that we kind of make it sticky. You know, this famous expression, making it sticky. Harvard loves this. You know. So it's, we won't change if we can't make it sticky. We can't make it real and practical and achievable and logical to people. And there's plenty of examples <coughs> through the research uh, community who will make themselves available through to businesses and to communities to develop the knowledge and uh, applications that will allow you at least to develop products, goods and services and uh, societal ambitions that are more sustainable. I know it's very heavy stuff for uh, Thursday morning, you know, but at least I just wanted to put the day in context for you of what uh, the purpose really of what GIFT is trying to do and indeed ourselves and others in, in the state are trying to do. I wish you well for your day. I'm going to sit in now and look forward to the uh, chats and share your experiences with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>